Good afternoon. My name is David Cooper, and I would like to welcome you to the 2023 Sawin Historical Lecture. This is most assuredly a, memori a very memorable occasion, the centennial meeting of the American Thyroid Association. I'm confident that everyone in this room is aware of the history being made this week and the historical nature of your own participation in this extraordinary event. In recognition of the ATA centennial and the centennial celebration, the ATA History and Archives Committee and the ATA Centennial Task Force jointly agreed that this year's Sawin Historical Lecture would be devoted to the founding and subsequent history of the ATA. But before I introduce today's speaker, I'd like to say a few words about, their doc about Dr. Clark Sawin, the namesake of today's lecture. Dr. Clark T. Sawin was a Boston native. He graduated from Brandeis University in 1954. He was one of the first graduating classes of this new university. And then he attended Tufts University School of Medicine, graduating in 1958. After serving in the Army Medical Corps, he completed a fellowship in endocrinology at the Tufts New England Medical Center under the direction of Edwin Ted Astwood, who, as you know, is the father of antithyroid drug therapy. During his productive clinical research career, Dr. Sawin made many important contributions to thyroidology, especially in the area of subclinical thyroid dysfunction and thyroid disease in older persons. He was chief of the endocrine diabetes section at the Boston VA Medical Center from 1966 to 1998, and a professor of medicine at Tufts University School of Medicine, and then later on at Boston University School of Medicine. And it was while I was a student at Tufts Medical School in the 1970s that I met Dr. Sawin, and he became one of my mentors and my friend. In 1998, he moved to Washington, D.C. to serve as an inspector for the Veterans Administration, leading efforts to uh, improve veterans' endocrine and diabetes care. While his contributions to thyroidology and patient care are notable, medical history was his passion with a special interest in the history of endocrinology. In this arena, he wrote more than 80 articles and historical vignettes, many about the historical giants of thyroidology and the clinical advances in the care of patients with thyroid disease. Many of his papers appeared in a journal called The Endocrinologist, which is no longer published, but they can be found online and also in a volume entitled A Biographical History of Endocrinology published by the Endocrine Society. Medical history was not simply a hobby for Dr. Sawin. He was an authentic and professionally recognized medical historian. In his work, he strived not only to tell the story of endocrine discovery, but importantly, how that discovery was influenced and resonated in the context of other medical and non-medical events that were occurring at the same time period. Among his many uh, honors and awards was the 1990 Reynolds Award from the American Phy Physiological Society for his work in the history of physiology. Dr. Sawin initiated the historical vignette lecture series at the annual meeting of the ATA in 1989 with a talk on the history of the use of thyroid hormone preparations. The idea of an annual lecture on thyroid history became a tradition that continues to this day. At the time of his death in, two, uh, in uh, 2004, at the age of 70, Dr. Sawin was president of the American Thyroid Association. After his passing, to continue Dr. Sawin's work in endocrinology history, his family established the Clark T. Sawin History Resource Center at the ATA and the Clark T. Sawin Memorial Library at the Endocrine Society. The annual Sawin Lecture at the ATA honors Dr. Sawin's legacy with an annual speaker selected under the purview of the ATA History and Archives Committee, although as I mentioned earlier, this year's speaker, Dr. Peter Kopp, was selected jointly by the History and Archives Committee and the Centennial Task Force. Dr. Kopp is well known to everybody in this room uh, since he's the past editor-in-chief of our flagship journal, Thyroid, and the immediate past president of the American Thyroid Association. He spent much of his career as a professor and director of the Center for Genomic Medicine at Northwestern University School of Medicine, 
before moving back home to Switzerland to become professor of medicine and médecin chef of the Department of Endocrinology, Diabetes, and Metabolism at the University of Lausanne. Like Dr. Sawin, Dr. Kopp is not only an illustrious endocrinologist and leader in the field. Oh, there's a picture of Dr. Kopp, if you could put that up, although you're going to see him shortly. <laughs> but he's also an acknowledged medical historian, and he was a protege of Dr. Sawin. Indeed, Dr. Kopp has presented or moderated four Sawin lectures. The most recent was in, 19, in 2022, devoted to uh, neonatal screening for congenital hypothyroidism. In recognition of the ATA centennial, I would now like to give the floor to Professor Peter Kopp, who will speak about what else? The American Thyroid Association, the organization that we cherish. The topic of his lecture is the American Thyroid Association, 1923 to 2023, honoring our past, embracing our future. Dr. Kopp. Thank you very much, David, for your introduction, for your comments on Clark Savin, and for your kind words. Ladies and gentlemen, dear friends and colleagues, members and guests, good afternoon. It is a special honor to address you today to mark our centennial and to reflect on the themes of where do we come from, what are we, and where are we going? Many have contributed insights and information for this presentation, and their contributions are gratefully acknowledged. The contributions of three individuals need to be highlighted in particular. I had the privilege of working with David Cooper in preparing this talk and the historical review that has just been published in Thyroid. His comprehensive knowledge and his infectious enthusiasm and energy have played a key role in the creation of these overviews. Dr. Valerie Galton has been instrumental in updating the timelines located on the ATA website, and she has an incredible fund of knowledge uh, on the history of our uh, field. And finally, Charlene Kano, Director of Publications and Membership of the ATA, has assisted David and me with pertinent information about many details of our organization including membership statistics. Well, it all started in the prairie of Illinois. Would you have thought so? Halfway along the railroad between Chicago and St. Louis in Bloomington, a town of 28,000 inhabitants according to the 14th census of the United States, completed in 1920. For comparison, in 1920, Chicago had about 2.7 million inhabitants. Of note, in 1856, at Majors Hall in Bloomington, Abraham Lincoln delivered his famous lost speech on slavery during a convention to organize what was, was then another Republican Party in Illinois. The famous Route 66 was created a few years later in 1926, and Bloomington became an important stop in Illinois. At the time of the founding of the American Association for the Study of Goiter in 1923, this was the original name, we are at the beginning of the Roaring Twenties, a few years after the global influenza pandemic and the end of World War I, which had, ironically, a significant positive impact on the American economy through the sales of weapons. For the first time, more Americans are living in cities than in rural areas. Radio is widely available and has a huge social impact. The film industry is soaring, and Hollywood is releasing more than 800 films per year. Jazz enters the music scene. The Harlem Renaissance is underway. African Americans and women begin to express themselves more freely. The flapper redefines the modern look of women in Western societies. Life is again in full swing. The Model T Ford automobile is fundamentally changing transportation, and by 1924, more than 10 million are sold. The assembly line becomes part of the industrial production. Prohibition, lasting from 1920 to 1933, 
bans the production and the sale of alcohol and results in a rise in organized crime. The Roaring Twenties ended abruptly with the crash of the stock market in 1929, which marked the beginning of the Great Depression. Here, a few major events of the early 20s so that we get into the uh, sense of this time. In 1999, the Treaty of Versailles was signed and the Grand Canyon National Park created. In 1920, the 19th Amendment grants women the right to vote. The Spanish influenza pandemic ends and there are raids across the US in search of communists. In 1921, Warren Harding is sworn in as the 29th president of the US and Winston Churchill becomes the British Minister of Colonies. In 1922, Mahatma Gandhi is sentenced to prison for disobedience. James Joyce publishes Ulysses. In 1923, Warren Harding dies and Calvin College becomes president. The National Women's Party first uh, proposes the Equal Rights Amendment to eliminate discrimination on the basis of gender. It has never been ratified. 1924, Lenin, Lenin dies, college is elected president, IBM is founded by Thomas Watson, and the Immigrant of Act of 1921 and 1924 closes America to East European Jews and others. Finally, in 1925, Hitler publishes Mein Kampf, Mussolini dissolves the Italian parliament, and Nellie Taylor Ross is elected as the first female government in the US in Wyoming. A few further trivia and pearls on 1923. The US life expectancy for females is 58.5 years. For males, it's 56.1 years. The Nobel Prize for Physiology and Medicine goes to Frederick Grant Banting and Joan James Richard MacLeod for the discovery of insulin. And the Nobel Prize for Literature to William Butler Yeats. Evan Hubble discovers galaxies outside the Milky Way. And in 1923 also, the first issue of Time Magazine is published. The Yankees play the first home game in the original stadium. The Firestone Tire and Rubber Company starts producing inflatable tires, and Coca-Cola invents the six-pack. Now black to Bloomington, Illinois. Bloomington is located in the so-called goiter belt. 30 to 40% of the population had goiters in 1922, and the prevalence was as high as 60% in some communities. Examination of World War I military draftees demonstrated high goiter rates, particularly in the upper Northwest and Great Lakes regions, where up to 31% of candidates were disqualified from military service because their necks were too large to fit into a uniform. Moreover, surveys carried out by the US Public Health Service in the 1920s revealed goiter rates up to 70 to 100% in school children from parts of Minnesota, Michigan, and Wisconsin. In the early 1920s, the concept that this was due to iodine deficiency, deficiency just started to emerge. Because of the medical significance of endemic goiter, a group of surgeons began to meet informally in Bloomington, Illinois, as the Illinois Clinical Club, under the direction of Edwin Plummer Sloan, shown here. After a surgical residency, Dr. Sloan received additional training at clinics in Berlin, Germany, and with the famous Theodor Kocher in Bern, Switzerland. World War I had created a demand for surgeons including in areas of the country where goiter was prevalent. However, on their return from the war, there were often operative complications to the surgeon's inexperience with thyroid surgery. It was in this environment that Dr. Sloan proposed an organization of medical men from across the country that would include not only surgeons, but also experts from all medical disciplines to stimulate research into the cause of goiter and to advocate for improved treatments and possible prevention. Around the same time, there were significant breakthroughs related to iodine prophylaxis thanks to the work of several physicians in Switzerland and the United States. 
In 1915, Honsiker demonstrated that treating school children with small doses of iodine prevents goiter formation, and he proposed salt iodization. Otto Bayar, a physician working in a mountain valley, performed well-structured and controlled trials with various doses of iodine and showed that as little as 30 micrograms of iodine prevents goiter formation. Both physicians also emphasized that there are no occurrence of the feared yod basidov phenomenon. Finally, Hans Eckenberger launches a popular initiative and convinced the Swiss Goiter Commission to introduce salt iodization. This led to the official introduction of salt iodization in Switzerland in 1922. By 1930, all cantons enforced the state mandated iodide salt prophylaxis, which immediately reduced the phenomena of goiter and cretinism. And at the same time, in the United States, Marin and Kimball conducted the famous trial in school children in Akron, Ohio, and independently showed that the supplementation of iodine prevents goiter formation. Salt iodization is introduced then in 1924 in Michigan and then gradually in the other states. On December 6, 1923, in Bloomington, Illinois, Dr. Sloan's vision to create a professional organization was realized in the formation of the American Association for the Study of Goiter. That's the centennial we are celebrating today. Remarkably, on the same day, U.S. President Calvin College made his first State of the Union address, and this was the first time it was broadcasted on nationwide radio. Dr. Sloan was inaugura inaugurated as the first president of the ASGG for the years 1923 to 1924. According to a recollection of the early history of the society, there were 26 charter members, including a Denver surgeon, Seymour van Meter, who initiated the van Meter Award in 1930 during his presidency, as well as his daughter, Dr. Virginia van Meter, who was also a surgeon. Of note, Dr. Henry Plummer, an internist, was also one of the founding members of the society. All the others were, as far as we can tell, surgeons. In addition to Dr. Sloan, seven additional charter members shown here in red became future presidents of the ASG. AS, ASG. A call for a meeting was uh, made immediately and, among others, published in the New England Journal of Medicine. The first regular meeting then occurred a little bit more than a month later at the Unitarian Church during January 23-25 in 1924 in Bloomington, with more than 200 physicians in attendance. Lectures included, among others, an analysis of the types of goiter with indications for treatment radium treatment of goiter, and a review of another year's work with thyroid disease by Dr. Frank Lahey, who could not attend the meeting, and interestingly, the use of seaweed in the prevention and treatment of goiter by Dr. Turretin from the U.S. Department of Agriculture. There were also debates on the causes and classification of goiter, with emphasis on the benefit of appropriate classification which might, importantly, lead to non-operative treatments. The Daily Program was published in the local newspaper, the Daily Pantograph, each morning. In addition to the more than 50 lectures during the three-day meeting, operative clinics were held each day at two local hospitals where surgeons demonstrated the latest surgical and anesthetic techniques. Interestingly, the names of the patients who were to have surgery were also published in the local newspaper. <laughs> Networking played an important role as well. As stated here, and this was published in the Pantograph, a banquet last evening was one of the enjoyable features of the day. There was a large attendance and the menu was an elaborate one. So much of the early history of the AASG had to be pieced together by Dr. Cooper and myself because the records of its early years were in large part destroyed in a fire. 
We have extracted information from society meeting minutes and the transaction of the American Association for the Study of Goiter, which can be found in the ATA archives. A few other testimony, testimonies have provided important insights. Among them, Dr. Gordon Farney, one of the founding members, wrote his recollections in 1973 when the association turned 50. Dr. Farney was a Canadian whose father immigrated from Switzerland and he served as the fourth ATA president in 1928. He wrote, the first decade in the life of our association typified somewhat that of a surgical club, the members of which assembled each year to compare experience and to work toward a broader perspective. But he also added, basic in this plan was to bring into membership the other branches of our profession interested in thyroid problems. In this, we were successful, and some of our first recruits were internists and research workers in this field. Then followed endocrinologists and biochemists, and as the years went by, our membership increased and broadened to include all phases of effort in thyroid problems. Hence, obviously, there was a very open-minded and integrating vision among the early members of the association. Let us now put the foundation of the AASG succinctly into a broader and international context. A year earlier, on June 24, 1922, as mentioned, the Swiss Goiter Committee, presided by Fritz de Kervin, the successor of Theodor Kocher as chair of surgery in Bern, took a historic and courageous decision, despite of very strong resistance by some of its members on June uh, of the committee. He officially, and the committee officially recommended that every canton should make iodized salt available to its people. In response to a popular initiative, as mentioned, the first canton introduced the first formal salt iodization at the population level shortly thereafter. And in 1924, the first U.S. state, Michigan, introduced salt iodization. Then, in 1927, a key event was held in Bern, Switzerland, the first international conference on goiter. The first international goiter conference in Bern, my hometown, by the way, was attended by 188 delegates, including surgeons, internists, researchers, pathologists, and public health authorities from 18 countries. 26 delegates were from the United States and included key AASG members, among them Rudolf Young, a founding member and AASG president in 1936, who wrote a detailed report on the conference. The program was chiefly concerned with the etiology and prevention of edemic goiter. The presentations were held in French, German, Italian, or English, and published in the original languages, but also translated into English. The main resolution was to disseminate the information about the effect of iodized salt to all regions affected by endemic goiter. A detailed summary of all subsequent meetings, the presidents, secretaries, and treasurers of our organization can be found in the Clark T. Salmon History Resource Center on the ATA website. The first International Goiter Conference was followed by a second conference in 1933, also in Bern, and the third conference in Washington, D.C. was held in the historic Mayflower Hotel, just a few blocks from here in 1938. The plans for the Washington meeting were put in place by the AASG leadership and were supported by various American medical societies. Dr. Seymour van Meter took the initial uh, lead for the organization of the meeting before his passing in 1934. Then the horrors of World War II also led to a hiatus in the activities of our organization. Canada had entered the war already in 1939 and on December 8, 1941, one day after the bombing of Pearl Harbor, the United States entered World War II. Three days later, after Germany and Italy declared war on the US, 
the United States become fully engaged in the war. At that time, Dr. John Pemberton, a prominent surgeon and chief of the surgical section at the Mayo Clinic, was president of our organization. We do remember him for the Pemberton sign, not for the fact that he has been the president of our organization with the longest tenure from 1942 to 1946 because of the war. Around 1960, the uh, American Association for the Study of Goiter under, underwent two name changes. In 1959, the AASG was incorporated in the New York State as the American Goiter Association. And in 1961, the name was changed to our current name, the American Thyroid Association, reflecting a shift from a focus on goiter to a broad spectrum of thyroid pathophysiology, including hypothyroidism, hyperthyroidism, and thyroid cancer. Similarly, the international meetings were also renamed after the fourth International Goiter Conference in London. The meeting in 1965 in Rome, Italy, was named the Fifth International Thyroid Congress, and the ITC is now held every five years. This slide, with data compiled by uh, David Cooper, summarizes the founding years of our main sister societies, such as the BTA, JTA, ETA, LATS, and AOTA. And below the timeline, uh, you see the date of the creation of several other selected professional societies, such as the Endocrine Society, with close interactions with our subspecialty. As mentioned, most of the documents of the early history of the AASG were lost in a fire. This emphasizes the urgency to digitize our records and archives in the near future. In 1950, Dr. Rudolf Young wrote a text entitled American Association for the Study of Goiter, Early History, International Conference on Goiter, that provides information about the origin, objectives, founding members, national and international meetings, goiter classification, publications, and officer. This overview has not been published, uh, but is available in the archives of the ATA. Here are just as an example, two excerpts of the first meeting and the officer who served in the early years. In 1973, for the 50th anniversary, we do have a copy of the presidential address by Dr. Sidney Werner from Columbia University. He had published the first version of the now famous uh, textbook, The Thyroid, a Fundamental and Clinical Text, in 1955. Now this book is, as you all know, entitled Werner and Ingvars, The Thyroid. The presidential address from 1973 does not tell a lot about the history of the organization, but reflects that there were some questions about the future goals of the organization. I do quote, should we have a role apart from our scientific meeting in education of the profession at large and of the service to the public? How far can we go in helping to identify and publicize risk to the population at large, such as from iodine want or excess. To patients whose thyroids were exposed to radiation in infancy, in screening the newborn for hypothyroidism. Obviously, the answer was yes, and has led to a significant expansion from a focus on goiter to all aspects of thyroidology. He also wrote, if yes, should these initiatives be funded and who would do the work? Finally, will changes in research support affect the composition and productivity of our membership and how active can we be in defense of our field? Don't these questions sound familiar? It sometimes seems that there is nothing new under the stars. I have mentioned Dr. Farney before. He has published this uh, recollection, uh, recollection on the organization and growth of the American Thyroid Association in 1973 with a focus on the time between 1923 and 1950. 
This is by far the most informative report on the development of our organization from where it came and how it evolved, and I encourage you to retrieve it from the ATA website. This slide shows the map of all meeting locations of, over the last 100 years. According to the website, our centennial meeting is actually the 93rd annual meeting. Interestingly, the four international Goiter conferences have been counted towards this number, but the international thyroid conferences have not. As you also know, in addition to the hiatus caused by World War II, the 2020 meeting had to be canceled, and the 2021 meeting was held virtually because of the COVID pandemic. By far, the most meetings have been held in Chicago, with 12 meetings overall, and nine meetings took place in Canada. This overview illustrates the four international Goiter conferences held between 1927 and 1960, and the international thyroid uh, conferences held every five years since 1965 in Gray. The meeting in Xi'an could not take place as planned, again, because of the COVID pandemic. And in 2025, we will gather for the 17th meeting in Rio de Janeiro. A professional organization such as the ATA is, of course, embedded and exposed to the societal, political, and economic environment. Because of that, and linked to recent decisions of the Supreme Court, the Board of Directors has formulated and published a formal meeting site policy in May 2023. And I felt it is of some relevance to draw attention to this. Without going through all details, the ATA is committed that the meeting site must fulfill the following key criteria. The ability for attendees to feel welcome and safe, regardless of their racial, ethnic background, national origin, gender, sexual orientation, religion, or eventual disability. The presence of healthcare policies that emphasize science and evidence-based practices and promote health equity. And finally, attendee safety, including the ability to access appropriate emergency reproductive or gynecological care for themselves while attending the meeting. I think all important points. Let us... Thank you. Let us come back to the founding members and some demographic developments. The founding members included, as mentioned, 26 members, 25 surgeons, and Dr. Henry Plummer as internist. 25 were male and one female member. We will come back to her later. Until 1960, the majority of the members were surgeons. Uh, though this uh, then declined sharply until 1990, but we see a substantial increase of endocrine and ENT surgeons since the year 2000. This graph also uh, illustrates the demographic development within the ATA over the last 100 years, and the membership has increased to almost 1,800 members. Since the 1960s, the majority of the membership consists of endocrinologists, internists, and pediatricians, basic scientists, nuclear medicine specialists, pathologists, oncologists, and a few other specialists, specialties complement the spectrum of professional expertise. What has driven these changes? Accompanied by numerous scientific, medical, technological, and societal developments, there has been a constant and dynamic development which has impacted the focus and the composition of the ATA, as just illustrated with the demographics, and of course, the content of the annual meeting. A detailed summary of these milestones is not possible due to time constraints, but the timelines in the Clark T. Salmon History Resource Center provide a fantastic overview. And as mentioned, the work of Dr. Valerie Galton, as well as members of the History and Archives Committee on these timelines need to be gratefully acknowledged. So kudos, Val. Huh? 
just to cite a few key events. In the 1920s, iodine administration became routine as a preoperative measure in patients with toxic goiter. That is, was really um, driven by the work of Dr. Henry Plummer. Sir Charles Harrington identified the correct structure of thyroxine and synthesized the hormone. The clinical use of radioactive iodine for the therapy of hyperthyroidism and thyroid cancer was introduced in the 1940s. And at the, at the same time, antithyroid drugs entered the therapeutic realm. In, 1950, in the 1950s, T3 has been identified and characterized by Rosalind Pitt Rivers and Jack Ross, as well as Roche, Lisitsky, and Michel in Paris, France. In the 1950s, the basal metabolic rate to estimate thyroid function was supplanted by the measurement of protein-bound iodine. In the 1960s, radioimmunoassays became available, followed by immunometric assays, and the first screening for congenital hypothyroidism was performed in 1972. Since the 1980s, molecular biology has provided numerous pathophysiological and genetic insights, and the therapy of thyroid cancer has fundamentally changed in recent years with the advent of systemic therapies. We could go on and on with the history of thyroidology, but let us focus again on the history of our organization. Let us come back one more time to the founding members. As mentioned, there were 25 male surgeons and one woman, Dr. Virginia Van Meter. Who was this personality? Dr. Virginia Van Meter was the daughter of Dr. Seymour Van Meter. Both were founding members of the AASG. Seymour Van Meter chaired um, an AASG committee on goiter classification and nomenclature, an influential report that was published in 1929. According to this classification, goiters were stated to be either diffuse or nodular, and within those categories, non-toxic or toxic. Sounds very logic. In the same year, he served as president of the AASG. In 1930, and annually for several more years, he anonymously donated funds to support an award for the best essay on the subject of goiter, especially its basic cause, which has evolved into the Van Meter Award, one of the ATA's most prestigious honors. Dr. Virginia Van Meter obtained her MD degree from the University of Pennsylvania in 1922, and she was the first female surgeon in Colorado. More details on the fan meters can be found in the detailed historical note by Dr. Jim Magner. 1962, 39 years after the foundation of the American Association for the Study of Goiter, and one year after the American Goiter Association was transformed into the ATA, the first female president of the ATA was installed, Dr. Virginia Neeland Franz. A graduate from the Columbia College of Physicians and Surgeons in 1922, she became the first woman surgery intern at New York Presbyterian Hospital. In 1935, she described insulin-secreting tumors of the pancreas in collaboration with Dr. Alan Whipple, a name that is familiar to us. And in 1942, she was involved in the pioneering study demonstrating radioiodine uptake in a metastatic focus of well-differentiated thyroid cancer, but not in coexisting poorly differentiated metastases. Virginia Neal in France was followed by other women as ATA presidents. Over the past 100 years, the ATA had a total of 96 presidents, seven of them women, two between 1923 and 2001, five of them between 2002 and 2023. This graph shows membership uh, by sex in the ATA. For the period until the early 1960s, it is actually difficult to extract information about the makeup of the organization by sex because the listings utilize first name initials and the sex of individual participants can usually not be identified. As you can see, women now, women now make up 45% of the membership, and I have heard that for the first time, there are more female attendees uh, at this meeting than men. 
So we will see how this development will go on. Numerous women have made major contributions to thyroidology, and they will be honored in a special session dedicated to female pioneers in thyroidology by the Women in Thyroidology group on Saturday morning at 8.55, uh, led by Dr. Singh Ospina and Dr. Angela Wang. We have talked about many of the presidents whose biographical sketches have been added to the Clark T. Summon History Resource Center, an effort led by David Cooper, Valerie Galton, Connie Trump, and Carolyn Nguyen. These personalities have clearly shaped the activities, mission, and vision of our organization over the last century. But we have not talked about the fact that they were assisted by numerous colleagues, in part from other specialties, nurses, staff, and personal secretaries. So I think this merits a, uh, an important parenthesis here. Until 1988, numerous individuals have supported our leadership with secretarial assistance, and they are acknowledged here anonymously. In 1988, with the launch of Len Wartowski's secretaryship in September, Bobby Smith was the first full-time ATA executive administrator to take office. The ATA office consisted of a single room on a hospital ward at Walter Reed Army Medical Center. Bobby and Len fundamentally reorganized the financial and administrative uh, governance. Of course, all was still on paper. One board meeting was held per year during the annual meeting until Len instituted the second at the Endocrine Society. In 1990, the journal Thyroid was launched, and in 1991, the then ATA president, Connie Pittman, suggested emphatically that the organization finally get the fax machine. <laughs> so the modern era had begun. Um, now, after the conclusion of the five-year term of Bobby and Len, Bobby left the ATA and worked for other organizations. For several years, the admit administrative work was then taken on by Diane Miller until 2001, here shown with then-secretary Paul Ladenson and treasurer David Cooper, as well as board members Elliot Levy, Xiao Yan Cheng, and Marvin Gershengorn. In 2001, after a strategic planning session of the board, Paul Ladenson recruited Bobby again as the first executive director of the ATA. Bobby moved the office from New York to Falls Church, secured space in computers, and hired staff, and started preparing for the meeting that was supposed to begin on 9-11-2001, here in Washington, D.C. And as you all know, this fateful day led to the cancellation of the meeting but it then took place later in November, illustrating resilience and dedication of leadership, membership, and staff. The former, former and current staff members are shown here with Bobby, and we thank them again for their fantastic support of the ATA. Then, after 25 years of dedicated and transformative leadership for the ATA, Bobby announced her well-merited retirement in 2019 for May 2020, and she has been celebrated at the Chicago meeting in 2019. Amanda Pearl, our new executive director, took office in May 2020 in the midst of the COVID pandemic. Amanda has a long-standing experience in association leadership, and before joining the ATA, she has worked as Chief Global Member Engagement Officer at the Endocrine Society. Amanda has been key in navigating us through the complicated years of the pandemic, and it is a highly dynamic and thoughtful steward. In short, in short a true pearl. So what is our vision and mission? The vision of the ATA is optimal thyroid health for all. And the mission statement reads, transforming thyroid care through clinical excellence, education, scientific discovery, and advocacy in a collaborative community. 
Numerous means are used to achieve these goals and include, among others, the annual and other educational meetings, the support of trainees through programs such as the Chester Ridgeway Conference, high quality guidelines, the activities of the committees and task forces, and our publication portfolio. The journals include Thyroid, the official journal of the ATA that was launched in 1990 with Dr. Jeremy Hirschman as founding editor. It is complemented by Clinical Thyroidology, started already in 1988, Clinical Thyroidology for the Public, 2008, and Video Endocrinology, 2014. Jerry Hirschman's dedication to our field and the journal Thyroid was even reflected on his license plate. Now I can. Dr. Hirschman was followed by Terry Davis and Charles Emerson, then followed myself and Electron Kebabu, and now Thyroid is in the hands of Anna Safka. It is noticeable that the editors in chief of the three main publications are currently all women. Anna Safka leads Thyroid, Angela Lang oversees clinical thyroidology, and Catherine Sinclair is at the helm of video endocrinology. The hour is almost over, and although many, many other aspects would need to be highlighted and presented, we need to conclude. In addition to the resources in the Clark T. Salmon History Resource Center of the ATA, on the ATA site, you can find other details on the history of our organization in the mentioned article that has just been published in Thyroid, and uh, in the panels in the atrium that provide a succinct overview of key milestones in the history of our organization and thyroidology. And I really encourage you to look at these panels because it's important, in my opinion, to know where we came from and uh, the past informs our present and the future. What lies ahead of us? In his recollections written in 1973, Dr. Farney wrote, our thyroid association kept pace with and helped to stimulate and develop the sequence of changes over the years of which we are all so proud. And this is indeed true. I think uh, the organization has been really adapting uh, fantastically well to the change in challenges. But we have a lot of work and projects to tackle. Scientific discovery is in part dependent on appropriate funding, sources that must be defended. Much work needs to be done toward the elimination of national and global disparities and inequities in terms of access to health care and education. Adequate iodine supplies need to be defended. And we heard this morning that even in the US, you know, iodine intake decreases. Novel technology, as also illustrated at this meeting, impacts society and medicine, and we need to integrate them creatively and uh, with uh, thought. The ATA is committed to diversity and integration much more needs to be done in that realm. Importantly, the organization is embedded in a global context, and worldwide collaborative efforts, building bridges and connections are key to respond to the challenges of the future with constructive and sustainable solutions. Finally, as emphasized by Dr. Souza this morning, we need to constantly and critically question our activities and future directions and adapt to change. All these goals can only be achieved by ongoing engagement and citizenship of the ATA membership, you, and as illustrated by our history, openness to dynamic change and constant reorientation, and your commitment to the organization. These activities need ongoing support and nurturing of the ATA funds that have been truly transformative. This includes the Richway Legacy Fund supporting the training course and the Refeta Fund, which supports fellows, trainees, and young investigators, as well as the International Workshop on Resistance to Thyroid Hormone Action. And it also includes our endowed lectureship series listed here on the right. 
So summarizing the development and achievements of our organization, uh, covering a whole cent century in less than an hour, has obviously forced me to leave out numerous facets and nuances. Nevertheless, I hope that this overview has provided you with some insights into the questions, where do we come from, what are we, and where are we going? Let us enter the ATA's new century with a renewed commitment to the prevention and innovative treatment of thyroid disorders with dedication to excellence in clinical care and research and with a collaborative approach and an inclusive membership. I thank you very much for your attention.